Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, before we begin tonight, I'd like to first acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of the Atawandran, the Anishinaabe, and the Haudenosaunee peoples. Uh, the Center for International Governance Innovation, where, which is where we are right now, is situated on the Haldeman Tract, which is the land promised to the Six Nations that includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. And actually, little known, little known fact, the Grand River runs, uh, a, a portion of the Grand River uh, runs uh, right under where we are right now. It's a natural aquifer. So, I, But we're not talking about geology tonight. We're here to talk about something a little bit different. We're here to talk about data. Um, so good evening and welcome to the CG campus. Now, CG welcomes the opportunity to talk about pressing issues in global governance uh, big challenges in the way that we choose to regulate ourselves, the way that we choose to govern ourselves, and ultimately the way that we choose to interact as a society. And one of the crucial elements that, of, of the way that we do this is through data. It's through the digital, the digital economy. So we're happy to talk about this, but I'm also glad to see you all here tonight because while we like to talk about global policy, we also like to be part of a local discussion. And I'm inspired by the fact that so many people turned up tonight to engage in a vibrant public policy debate right here in Waterloo Region. Now, a big part of the data discussion revolves around trade, and not since the early 1990s has trade occupied such a prominent place in Canada's national discourse. Negotiations around CETA, TPP, NAFTA 2.0, they've re really reinforced the important role that trade policy plays in the free flow of goods across borders. But when we think about trade, we usually think about stuff like auto parts, beef, uh, and maple syrup. Indeed, it's these move, the movement of these sorts of goods that still dominates the public perceptions or popular perceptions of international trade. But trade in another highly valuable, albeit less visible commodity is on the rise and deserves greater attention in the public discourse. And that's data. Hailed by some as the new oil, uh, data is fueling today's artificial intelligence revolution and is fast becoming an indispensable asset across all industries. It is no overstatement to say that we are now truly in a data-driven economy, especially here in the Waterloo, uh, the Waterloo region. And in fact, actually, um, I was fortunate enough to, to have dinner this evening with the, the head of the Data Hub uh, right here in Waterloo region to learn about some of the interesting things that they're doing. And believe me when I tell you that, that this is a huge aspect of the new economy. Now at CG, we've been thinking hard about what all this means for Canada and for the world. We've been asking how big data will be governed and how we will balance our various commercial, social, and national security interests that are engaged by transnational data flows. And the fruits of this, uh, this labor can be found on CG's website in our essay series, Data Governance in the Digital Age. Now one of the great minds behind this work is Susan Aronson. Uh, Dr. Aronson is a senior fellow at CG in our Global Economy Program and is a professor at the Elliott School of International Affairs at George Washington University. Now, if I were to detail uh, Dr. Aronson's many scholarly achievements uh, in the introduction, it would turn into a keynote. You'd be listening to me all evening. Suffice it to say, she's a prolific researcher um, and has made, has, is a leading authority on the architecture of, and the effects of globalization. Indeed, her list of publications could double as a comprehensive syllabus for Globalization 101. And I mean comprehensive. Not only has she written extensively about trade, she has devoted equal energy to exploring the myriad of social and political consequences of an ever more digital and ever more interconnected world. As such, her research ranges from corporate responsibility to internet governance to human rights and labor. Her work is diverse, but one common theme is now a focus on how trade and a globalized economy stands to affect our personal, professional, and social lives. In that spirit, she has written books aimed not only at specialists, but also at youth and the broader public. In sum, Dr. Aronson brings both depth and breadth of perspective that is essential when analyzing cross-cutting issues like data trade and governance. Her presentation this evening will examine not only the governance of trade and data, but how this might fit in a broader societal framework for using and governing data and the collection of big data. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to this evening's speaker, CG Senior Fellow, Dr. Susan Aronson.
Hi, everybody. It's so nice to be welcome to Canada. I feel like I often when I travel overseas, I have to apologize for my country's nuttiness these days. So it's so kind of you to welcome me here. Thank you. So here, this is what we are going to talk about, our data-driven future. And I look forward to discussing this with you. Unfortunately, I'm not able to move things forward, which is so embarrassing. So guys, if you could move the slide for me. Thank you. So at least you guys have a leader who not only knows how to read and likes to read, but also writes books. So thank you so much for welcoming me to a country where you, you've elected such a person. OK, we're going to have to do next slide, because this is, I think it's not on. OK, so here's what I'm going to talk about. I think, and I'm eager to hear what you think, our data-driven future can look sunny, but only if we allow greater control over our data. And you and I have to rethink not only how we regulate global data globally, but also rethink the notion of autonomy, which I'll explain in a little bit, and how we can be empowered by this technology that is built on data. In today's talk, I will describe what I mean by data and its import to the global economy and to Canada specifically. I'm going to compare the data-driven past, where basically companies were in control of our data, and our future, where we can be in control of our data. And I'm going to argue that the future you and I will drive, but only if we try to take control of our data. And show that if we show concern to our policymakers, we can get technologists to change the industry. Um, and I think that we should also talk about how we can be empowered and maintain our autonomy, our ability to make our own decisions when we want to and how we want to. So next slide, please. So this is just a discussion of what is data. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's some definition. There's nothing new in the trade of data, right? Human beings have always gossiped. Human beings have always traded information about the world that they encounter. But here's something that's new, OK? All of a sudden, thanks to the cloud industry, right, which has helped companies rent huge computer services, OK, we've created some new sectors. And those sectors include apps, industries built on artificial intelligence, Okay, and in order to do that, we trade in data. And what is data? Data is just facts and figures, right? You and I deal with it all the time. Next slide, please. Okay, but the thing is the data, the rules governing trade in data have to be different from the rules governing, let's say, trade in steel or, or deodorant or whatever. Here's why. Because data can be a lot of things simultaneously. First of all, data can be a good, it can be a service, it can be both at the very same time. It's incredibly easy to trade. And then data or information, which is simply information, a data that is processed. Right? So when we take statistics and we interpret it, it's processed can be a global public good, right? And when governments restrict such information, whether they do so, so through filtering or through censorship, that has huge implications for human rights, for scientific progress, and for the stability of the internet as a whole. And when we trade data, we do so on the internet, so we need to think about how it affects internet stability, because the internet is a global commons. OK, next slide. So what I want to talk about, and I, I'm not going to go into much data about this slide, but basically the internet has really changed since it, we all first became aware of it. 1995 is the first time we have the World Wide Web. You and I have been using email for an awfully long time, but since that time it's changed a lot because we have all these platforms 
that use lots of information that is processed. And what I'm talking about is everything from Twitter to Ford Motor Company site, right, where they might have broad statistics about how their cars are used and how often people break. Okay, next slide, please. The thing that is different is at one time, there were these internet dinosaurs, and we still live in this time. I had a video here, but we were, we're not gonna show it. Next slide, please. Okay, and these firms, right, Twitter, Google, Facebook, okay, they swept up our data, they digested it, and they created new businesses from our data. Most people don't really understand that when they sign up for Facebook or Twitter, they have basically assented to giving Twitter the ability to control their data, to market their data. Okay, and that's why they get the service for free. And what that means is that when they, so, when they signed up for Google or Facebook or Twitter, they became the product. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so why did this happen? Okay, well, just as human beings have evolved, the internet has evolved, and these sectors have been built on what I said was the cloud. The cloud is just such a jargony term, and it, it's hard for us to understand, but all that it means is it means computing as a service. And so what that meant is more and more firms had the ability to access huge amounts of data because they could rent computers as a service. And so they could use things like AI, and it became cheaper. Okay, and so as a result, more and more uh, firms started to use these cloud services. But these cloud services only work well when they have economies of scale for data because the more data they can get, more wealth, right? It's as simple as that. But also, they get better at using data, and they can train their algorithms to be more effective. Okay, next slide, please. But you see, the thing is that people are starting to force change to those internet dinosaurs because they're demanding that they, those firms start to think about how they use, protect, and build businesses from our data. And I just cite my own crazy country where the news that Facebook had sold all these ads to, to companies that they had no aware were fronts for the Russian government or other governments. That's pretty shocking news. Okay, next slide, please. So I think we're starting to see major changes, both in public policy, right? So the Europeans have about, have got this new legislation, regulation that is coming into place next week, which is going to require very stringent data protection policies for anybody that wants to trade data with Europeans. And then at the same time, innovators are starting to do things to protect our data, and blockchain could be such a strategy. And I just cite as example a Canadian company, Bitrush, which is an online advertisement brokerage platform that uses blockchain to protect people's data. That could be the wave of the future. I don't know. Blockchain is, is one possible way that things may move, but they will be moving, they will be evolving in a way that protects citizens' data more. Next slide, please. Okay. So what has happened here is that Lots of companies have gotten rich on our data, and we let them. And that's probably okay, because we got something in return, right? We got these fabulous social media sites and things like um, information about our um, practices. The problem is that we don't control what data gets out, and that data can be very complex and very weird and lead to some weird combinations, and maybe you've heard about issues related to the ethics of algorithm. But for example, um, one that uh, has become legendary, if you will, is that if you put in on Google, you search for baby, you don't get a, a child of color. 
And so, wait a minute, are there only algorithms that say that the only babies are white babies? So that's one example. Another example is when data is mixed. So when information pers based on personal data, yours and mine, that mixes income, political affiliation, sports teams, and creditworthiness, so that if you like uh, the Boston Red Sox as opposed to the Toronto Blue Jays, you might be found on the algorithm to be more credit worthy than someone, you know, who um, loves the Boston Red Sox. That, that's just a little bit weird. Why that mix? Why that algorithm? But this is where the future is going, and yet we're not in control, but I think we're starting to see the evidence that people are demanding some more control. Okay, but these things have effects on human autonomy and governance, and we all need to think very seriously about those things. Next slide, please. Okay, so, so governance. Most of us, we have enough to wrestle with on a daily basis, getting through our jobs, taking care of our families, getting some time to relax. But data has become so important that we need to find ways to make the rules governing data what we call interoperable, working across different nations. And that's one of the reasons why today, this week, the Canadians, the Americans, and the Mexicans are trying to find common ground on digital trade in NAFTA, for example. But all three nations, right, have very different rules regarding privacy, which the Europeans call data protection. Also, they have different norms and values regarding what data should be public, what data can be censored, what is national security data? In other words, what information you can or can't divulge about a nation's weaponry, okay, or scientific information. We are going to need to find common ground if we're going to continue to trade data across borders. Next slide, please. So just to give you some more examples of this, Canada, Canadians care deeply about data protection, about their privacy online. Um, the Canadian approach and the European approach are very different. And in order to trade data, they're going to have Canada and the EU are going to have to figure out not only the laws and regulations, but what is the appropriate behavior for corporations. They're also going to have to figure out issues like what rights do people have, not only to control their data, but to say what they should be able to put online and what they shouldn't put online, right? Things like censorship, disinformation, what is truth and what is rumors or lies, right? Germany has already passed laws on disinformation, making a crime. I don't see that happening in the United States but maybe it will. Malware and cybersecurity. Okay, everyone knows what malware is. We don't have shared norms regarding the use of it, and governments as well as criminal elements occasionally use malware to steal information or alter information. Censorship would be another one. And yet there isn't an explicit public discussion about these issues. But m since we're living more of our life online, even though we're busy, I urge you to think about these things and think where you want this to go. Because what I'm talking about in terms of data, that is you, okay? And you should have the right to control it. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, I just wanna give you some information, some more information about the current system of governance of data. First of all, it's not universal, which is odd because the internet is universal. And I would argue it's not universal because as the last slide said, we haven't figured out norms, right? And I think you have to have norms, shared norms, before you have laws. Now norms can change, right? Look at the United States global leader of efforts to free trade, all of a sudden a new president comes in and we're protectionism city. It's odd, right? So norms are not sufficient. You have to have laws and regulations. Moreover, 
some countries demand binding language, and other countries demand only aspirational language, which I call pretty words. Nations should, as opposed to nations will or shall. Okay, here's another thing that I don't think most people think about, but you and I live in countries where there are lots of internet firms and lots of other firms that use data and um, they, have, um, they have good rules governing to some extent what, what kind of data they use, right? What is proprietary, what is protected under intellectual property rules. But in many developing countries, they don't have those rules yet. They haven't put in place because they don't have citizens demanding that, right? So just think of, I don't know this for a fact, but I'm just going to use Malawi as an example. So to some extent, they have an opportunity to change the ongoing, the current matrix, right, where companies are in control. If countries have a lot of population, they have leverage to say to those firms, you are going to have to pay my citizens if you want to use their data. And believe me, in the future, Google and DeepMind and um, Shop, the, the firm that's right here, Shopify, they're going to want to have data from developing countries because that's where their future customers are. Okay. So it's important that they think about it. And then finally, the point I want to make is because we haven't evolved norms at the national level, we don't have a public discussion about these things, it's hard to do this at the global level or even among two countries because they don't share norms. So we don't agree as to what is the appropriate environment, what kind of laws we should have. And that's why I so appreciate this opportunity to talk with you because basically I'm begging you to ask your policymakers to have a public discussion about this. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so I have an idea about how we can force that public discussion. And I think the way we can do it is to reframe this discussion by type of data. So right now, the current system is in the trade regime, and we talk about it in terms of type of services that's offered, right? Computer services, as example. But I'm saying, why not talk about it in terms of the type of data? Okay, next slide, please. So here are the basic types of data. So the first type of data is personal data. Okay, so that's my passport number, my birth date, how many children I have, 311. Confidential business data. Well, that's things like payrolls, but it's also worker productivity. And pr confidential business data, which is also known as proprietary data, that has a lot of personal information there about workers and about shareholders and consumers, right? So there's personal data embedded in the second type. Then public data, and what I mean by public data is information in the public domain, but it's also information that is no longer copyrighted or patented, so it's gone out of monopoly control, if you will. And it's, it is the data that governments act as custodians for us on, right? Like we give census data to our policymakers, but that data belongs to us. So there is some personal data there too. Okay, then metadata. And this is a problem area. Metadata simply means big data that includes, it can include lots of personal data, but it's made anonymous. So there's personal data in there too. <laughs> and then finally, there's machine-to-machine -machine communication. So when you wear your smartwatch, right, and let's say it's a Samsung smartwatch or an Apple smartwatch, Apple has access to that information about how fast you run or when you schedule your appointments for or when you go to meet your psychiatrist, right? And so there's personal data in that too, right? So that gives you 
a rationale to control and to call for a new paradigm. Let me know what you think. OK, next slide, please. So I think each of these types of data can be treated differently at the national level. OK, but you and I need to demand that our governments do so. And, and what should we want? I shouldn't tell you what you should want, but my gut is that we should all want to ensure that our personal data is protected, that we encourage innovation, because that's the future of our, that's the future for our children and our grandchildren, and that's the future for our countries, right? And that we want the free flow of information, because we want, because data creates data, and that's a good thing. We'll have more knowledge as a result of that. But we're not going to share norms, right? Right now, the United States is wacky, and it's going to be hard to find common ground between Canadians and Americans on some things. So we need to find ways to make it interoperable, right? Work across different cultures. So those should be our goal. Next slide, please. OK, so I'm saying that if we do this by type of data, and in the past, we put this in an e-commerce chapter of a trade agreement. I think that's a bad idea, because what we're talking about is not e-commerce. E-commerce is when you buy stuff from Shopify or Amazon, right? There's a real financial transaction. But when you go on Facebook the, or you're searching for something on Google, there's no financial transaction. So it's a really different kind of trade there. But in any case, that's not my main point. My main point is we need to think about this in terms of data and giving people control over the data. Okay, and I think that'll be very helpful in terms of new sectors such as AI that rely on and that need lots of data. I think it could also help developing countries who are going to look at this and say, I'm going to be paying rents to essentially Canada and the United States and the UK, countries that are wealthy already, and they're just getting wealthier and wealthier on my data. But if they have control of data and they can say to Google, you want my citizens' data, you got to pay for it, then the citizens have leverage against those companies, and that may be a good thing. So that's my idea. OK, next slide, please. OK, I want to talk about another thing, which I think about a lot. So I used to be a professor at something called the National War College. And what that is, is that's the school where um, senior military from around the world go. It's in Washington. And they learn about strategy. And they called AI autonomy, which I always found very odd. But to me, autonomy is a really important thing to think about because I don't know about you, but I. I admit I use technology a lot. I love to tweet. I love the fact that I can do research on Google really quickly. So I'm definitely a beneficiary. It helps me feel empowered, but it doesn't help me feel autonomous, that I am in control of my destiny, especially when I think about AI. Okay, Because more and more machines will be making decisions. Next slide, please. So autonomy can be defined as your capacity to be your own person, to live your own life based on your decision. Okay, But I think more and more people feel confused and upset about autonomy because they see robots, and they see AI, and they see that as a threat to their autonomy. And they're right. They have a good point. I actually had a um, video here, but I don't see it which showed the latest robot from Boston Dynamics. OK, this is it. Thank you. I mean, doesn't this freak you out? It looks like a human being is in that robot. But this is what a robot can do today. And that might not threaten your autonomy unless you're like a guy who does that skiing stuff with you know all that acrobatics. I forgot what that's called. But in any case. That is the future, right? Next slide, please. And thank you so much. So what does this mean for Canada? I think Canada can play a really important role consistent with Canadian values here. Unfortunately, 
my nation can't right now, but I'm begging you to think about these things. So first thing is, people feel disempowered, I believe, to some extent, because as workers, whether we're skilled workers or less skilled workers, we less associate with each other and we have less collective bargaining power. So maybe one thing is to figure out new ways for workers to band together so they can be empowered in an age of technology. So that's thing one. Another thing we can think about is putting a stake in everybody. In the new world that we're living in, we have to invest in each other. And what I mean by that is that you and I are going to have many different jobs over time because technology is going to be constantly changing and we may lose our jobs as a result of technology. But if we keep learning new skills or learn how to do things differently and perhaps better, so I believe in the stakeholder model. And what that means is, and by the way, Britain has a stakeholder model. And so basically what they do is that every baby gets a certain amount of money that is held in a government fund, and they can take that fund, I think it's at age 18, please don't quote me at that because it might be 21, but they can take that funds and use it to invest in themselves in a way that benefits society. So investing themselves under that definition is they can build a company, they can get retrained, or they can go to school to get new, uh, to get you know, a PhD or whatever. And I think what that does is it shows everybody is bound together and we need to work together in ways that encourage us to be the most, you know, you know that um, be the most that you can be, be all that you can be. That's a way to do that. And society taking an investment, a stake in every person, I think is a good thing. Um, individuals can use that stake, as I said, to retrain, to build a business, to study, and that gives people options. That gives people autonomy, control over their destiny. And I think that's really, really important because the change that we're seeing is scary. Okay, and then I think people at all ages should be able to get an education. I read this fascinating article recently and it said that people shouldn't go to college at age 22. It said that people in their 60s and 70s should go to college and get a liberal education. That's the time to do it, they said, because even though I think young people do need critical thinking skills, you should be able to get an education at any time in your life. And that is good for all of us. Okay, next slide. And maybe give people sabbaticals. So why does all this matter for Canada and Canadians? I have a couple of reasons. Next slide, please. Okay, first, these sectors are gonna be essential to Canada. Um, Kaylee, one of your colleagues, made these slides for me. I think they're beautiful. So one is, this is gonna be a lot of money in Canada, right? So you can see the totals. Next slide. Canada is spending a lot of your tax dollars on building these sectors. This is a fabulous slide, I just love it. Okay, next slide, please. And that Canada is in an interesting role here, which is, first of all, Canada has long been an advocate of the open internet, of the free flow of data. Secondly, Canada has long been an advocate of the rule of law and trade. And we need to establish the rule of law in terms of data flows. Thirdly, Canada has com some comparative advantage in AI, right? Canada has some of the leading researchers in machine learning, but it has a small population. 38 million people is not enough to build AI. And by the way, 365 million people or whatever the United States has isn't enough either. And that's why Canada is signing so many trade agreements to get the rule of law and trade, but also to get data economies of scale. Canada should also be a rule maker. Right? You don't want to be a rule taker because you're a small country. It can maintain its strong system of data protection. And then also Canada and the United States and Mexico, all three of these countries have lots of contingent workers. Contingent workers mean that these are people who work without a contract without set benefits. And that is, I think, the future 
of many technology jobs. We see this more and more. And a country like Canada, and my own country should be doing the same, but we're not, um, should be pushing for ways to protect those workers. Right now, there's no language in trade agreements that protects them. But I think Canada, given its history, can play an important role here. And I'd be keen to hear what you think about that. OK, next slide, please. So in sum, I'm going to end on a, on a positive note, because I think one always should, that the data-driven future for you as Canadians and for me as Americans can look sunny. But we got to do some things to take control. Okay, and I think we need to rethink global approaches to regulating data. We need to remember the import of autonomy as we help people respond to technological change and new jobs. And we need to empower workers. Thank you so much for hearing me out. Next slide. Let me know what you think. Thank you. Wow. Well, <clears throat> I don't know whether to be uh, heartened or afraid. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to take a minute here. Well, that was a really, really insightful uh, presentation, and thank you for that. And as we were sitting there, I had a, a, a few kind of questions strike me. So um, maybe I'll, I'll ask you uh, kind of one that I had in the back of my mind. I think the subtext of your presentation was that control over data matters and that individuals should have a stake uh, in their in their information. So if we start from that premise, um, how could individuals have more control over their data? Well, I think everybody has to become educated as to the types of data and how their data is used. And I think most people don't know that there's three different types of data. I don't want to get into a lecture about it, but some of your data is observed data right, so companies observe what you're doing. Some of it is data that you give out yourself. Like, as I said, I'm a twitting, I'm a person who uses Twitter way too much. Also, as an academic, that's like a marketing tool. But I'm constantly saying my opinion on things. Who cares? But the fact is, I am constantly giving out my data. Okay, that is a choice I've made, but I need to be conscious of the implications of that. Companies take that, as I said before, like political affiliation and match it in algorithms to all sorts of other types of data. And that's where I think we need to take control of it. So there are ways that are evolving. Like one way is a personal data bank that, that banks need to be created, just as banks have been created to help us save and invest over time, we need to Think about ways that we can take our data and then maybe have a profession such as data broker, just as we have brokers for realtor for renters and brokers for sellers, right? So there's someone representing you. I can say to that data broker, my data is in the Susan Aronson data bank. And my data, I will sell it, but only if you use it for the following purposes. My data can be used for political affiliation. My data can be used um, for financial affiliation, but I don't want any personal information about my kids out there. I don't want any other type of information about my exercise habits and how often I go to see a psychiatrist or if I go see a psychiatrist, right? That kind of thing. That, we're busy people, right? And people are gonna have to choose is my data that important that I want to take the time to do this? But I think these things are going to evolve. We're going to need middlemen, and we're going to need to organize in groups of people to collectively ban to say, enough of misusing our data. These things we shall not stand for. Well, that's, re that's really insightful. So the, the, the notion that um, uh, kind of banding together and perhaps there is a, a certain element where uh, individuals might not have the requisite level of expertise to effectively engage in that discourse and may not have the necessary uh, power in that dynamic to, to, to um, advocate for themselves. Um, so 
I mean, maybe moving off of off of uh, kind of that that individual uh, that individual notion for a moment. And and as we're talking, if if anyone in the audience has questions, please feel free to come up. There's a microphone there and a microphone there, and we do want to make this an open an open uh, dialogue with uh, with our colleagues in the audience. So please feel free, and, and I'll call on you uh, as you uh, as you come to the mics. Um, so on the data driven economy. Um, like I get it, I understand that this is the next gen economy. That this is how wealth is going to get created. Do you think? And, and maybe so. I'll stop. Pause there for a moment, and I'll also say this: that regulation is a blunt force instrument. And so, do you actually think that Canada is at a point right now where we actually have enough knowledge about the power of data and its value to even effectively regulate it if we tried? I don't know the answer to that question, but I, what I think is really interesting is. I seem to be coming to Canada a lot to talk about it. And um, I do a lot of research on digital trade, so I, I'm also familiar with what other governments are doing. And I would say that Canada is one of the few nations that I know about that's actually trying to come up with a public plan and then to talk about it. And I think it's interesting that it's happening not just at the federal level, but at the provincial level. Mm -hmm. I don't see that happening yet. You know, in, in Europe, I think they've come up with some interesting ideas related to the GDPR. But that was kind of top-down regulation that resulted out of public protest, but it isn't in a dialogue with the people of Europe. There's been like this presupposition. Everybody wants data protection, and here's how we're going to do it. You know, in the United States, there's been a lot of, I'm going to use some Yiddish, kvetching. But there hasn't been like a, any sort of movement, a civil rights movement, about data. I think it's a coming, but we just have a lot of other things on our plate right now. Yeah, no, that's a that's a that's a. a that's yeah. my opinion. It might not be true. It's just my gut. No, fair fair enough. And we have a we have a question over here. Do you want to introduce yourself and then ask your question? Hi, yeah, I'm uh, Thomas Heisey. I'm a local here. Um, oh, is this on or is that okay? Anyway, I'm just okay. So uh, anyway, um, thank you for coming in, first of all. Uh, it's a very fascinating topic. Um, so for as far as I'm concerned, when I am um, divulging uh, you know, information about myself to different organizations, um, different corporations, let's say Facebook, Shopify, you gave an example of, anywhere else, um, you know, I'm always doing that essentially voluntarily. Or like you said, um, you know, if it's not that, then it's just passive observation from information that I am ambiently giving off. Now, in either case, um, that to me is essentially voluntary, um, unless there is some interception, you know, within my home, within my, you know, devices. Um, and so for me, I see the state as a third party, and I would just like you to elaborate more on why or what benefits there could be for allowing an individual within the state or a bureaucrat or whatnot for making rules about how I can interact with an organization or other people then? Well, thanks for your comments. I don't think um, any government official should make rules without a public consultation first, right? That's what we do in democracies. But the government is the custodian of our data in a democracy, right? Would you agree with that? And well, it's. I and it's our job to either prod legislators to come up with laws based on our opinion or to come up with regulations. Sure. And you don't think that, uh, well, let me ask you this. Yeah. Do you think firms are misusing our data when they sell it to data brokers? Again, this is a different kind of data broker, but you know, and, and I, I would not deprive Google of its advertising revenue or Facebook, but the model they came up with they're essentially taking our finger and selling it to many, many firms. We did not control that because we bought into a bargain. We got the free service. In return, we gave our data that they allegedly anonymize and then sell off. Is that okay to everybody? Well, just on your first point, I, I don't know about everybody else, but I mean, there's nobody behind me right now, so <laughs> I'm just gonna say. Um, so when you asked me uh, whether you, you know I would agree that I guess the state or the government should be a custodian of my data, I mean, I would far sooner give data to organizations like Twitter 
or Facebook or Google before I give it to the government of Canada, government of Ontario, region of Waterloo, city of Waterloo, simply because, I mean, those organizations have never told me what I can or cannot do outside of my negotiations with, um, with them, really. So for Facebook, for Google, I mean, I have absolutely in the past wanted them to have more information. Hey, please customize ads for me. Um, you know, I'd say that it comes down to really just torts then. So contractual agreement, you know, if I agree expressly that, you know, I consent to have my information used in a certain way, I just don't see why anybody else should be coming into that to diminish my ability to negotiate with that organization. I mean, but like you do said you before, have that ability to negotiate with Google? Absolutely, I can say no completely from the start. I mean, you but know, you they can't can do, say how your data is used right now. Well, I mean, Google can spend billions of dollars in advertising every year, and if I don't want to sign up for a Gmail account or for a Google account, I don't have to. That's right. That's the right. Government though can spend you know, I don't know, any amount of money really though, and say, hey, we don't want you to do this, or we do want you to do, do that, and I feel that they're in a very different position. I mean, whatever enfranchisement I might have with Google, or disenfranchisement, you know, that I'm not able to negotiate, I feel like I may have that little power, even with a state like the government of Canada, I might not be able to negotiate on that same level as Google, whereas Google, wants to provide me services to get my money, really, or to get somebody's money, but the government of Canada, I mean, they don't have to provide me anything and tell me that they want my money and get it from me, so. Right. You, know, he makes a, you, make, you make an interesting point, and I think it's, it, it's interesting for a few different reasons, and I can, I, I, I uh, at once, 100% agree with you and 100% disagree with you at the same time. And I'm going to tell you what I mean by that. So what he's talking about effectively is the way that a, your relationship is, is governed uh, with these large corporate actors, and it's around something called terms of service. So who here has scrolled through that big, long block of text when you're signing up for a service uh, and clicked I accept? Everyone. Who here has ever read those? I, you're not allowed to put your hand up. Who here has who here has never read that text before they've clicked on it? Everybody. Okay, so that's the nature of your relationship, and you're right to, to diagnose that as, a, as an issue of contract. Um, and so I think what's, what's ultimately happening, actually one interesting story, there is a company in the Valley right now that owns thousands and thousands of souls. And you say, well, how could they possibly do that? One year for April Fool's Day as, as a prank, they put in, this, in their terms of service that if you clicked I accept, they would forever uh, and forthrightly own your immortal soul. And so now they don't know what to do with all these souls that they own. The point is, is that that system is probably broken because our prem it's premised on informed consent, right? Our, our model is premised on informed consent. You're obviously uh, a little bit different than the average bear um, in, the, in the way that you're interacting, in the way that you're thinking about this issue. Um, I think the government's role uh, uh, is, to, is one where they can regulate to prevent abuses. Because let's, let's face it, um, uh, corporations are not um, uh, acting in your best interest. They are, by definition, acting in their own best interest. And it's, I think it's the role of the governance structure to make up that gap. Do you agree, Susan? Yeah, and I think, well, two things. First of all, thank you for your question. It seems to me when I'm saying government is custodian of your data, and, I mean, government's job is to regulate the market, right? And sometimes governments can regulate through naming and shaming. Sometimes they can regulate through direct and explicit regulation. There's all sorts of regulatory strategies. And you and I also have some power to regulate. We, too, can use naming and shaming. We can boycott. We can do all sorts of things. It is very difficult to boycott Google as a search engine. There are other search engines you can use. But... Probably Google is the best one. And you know why it is the best one? Because so many people use Google, right? And the same is true for apps and AI. Again, data breeds more data, and more data breeds more wealth. It's a really simple equation. So all I'm saying to you all is, I don't care how it is regulated, whether it's done by people banding in groups, self-regulation, or it's government regulation, my key point is that people need to be cognizant that when they're giving their data, they're giving a part of themselves. And I think a part of yourself you should control, 
And you have a right to be empowered during that process to make some decisions about it. That, that is the question of autonomy. And um, I could just take a seat again after this, this point uh, if anybody else wants to you know, come up. But um, um, I'll just say actually on your point, sir. Um, so uh, for me, really, it's uh, the big issue is incentives. So when you're saying that, that um, and, and I guess you're both saying that uh, it's government's job to regulate the businesses so that the information isn't misused. I mean, I would really say that it's these businesses that have a much larger incentive to make sure and regulate that they do not misuse it. Because if the state misuses it, I don't see where the disincentive for them is really. Whereas for an organization like Facebook or Google, I mean, they're highly incentivized to provide me with an excellent user experience with, you know, great products that I am going to be willing to, you know, part with my hard-earned money over. And um, for the government coming in as, to me, a third party to, you know, regulate my transaction with these organizations, I don't see where they have an incentive to provide me with that same level of service or a disincentive yeah. if my information is Absolutely. misused by them. But, but here's the thing, I don't know if you know um, the politics of Silicon Valley, and we shouldn't generalize, but um, many people in Silicon Valley were pretty close to the Obama administration, and I'm sure you know Hillary Clinton was not their perfect candidate, but those platforms, right, became her own mismanagement and other problems and you know allegations of corruption, all that stuff, right, and racism and sexism and all these things that are in all of our societies were out there too. But there wasn't that self-regulation, right? Facebook just sold the ads and didn't, you know, that's become a huge issue here. Did Silicon Valley create Trump? It's not just the media creating Trump. It's not just racism creating Trump. It's not just backlash against Obama. It's the internet played a huge role in empowering it through the lack of, I'm not saying government should do the regulation, but clearly there wasn't the self-regulation. And to me, Facebook is the perfect example of that. The money came first. Yeah, and I'm not saying one is even going to do a better job or the other, the government or the businesses. I'm just saying that from what I can see, the incentives lie with, I would say, the, the market-based yeah. um, organization simply because yeah. the only way that they can get more money out of me is providing me with better service. That's, That's true too, right? Yeah. Thank you. That was a good question. Thank, uh, thank you for that. Let's go over here. Hello. Please. Yes, I've been uh, doing a lot of research on risk management and how people are using um, international swapping and derivative associations as well as MLPs, which they're currently cracking down with in Scotland and other areas. And the FERC is cracking down on it as well. There's also certain firms that want to use tokens because they can't get shareholder money the normal way. <laughs> and believe me, the US SEC released a, a message in March saying, we're watching you. And uh, we know that you're not doing that great for normal share practices. And that is what we consider troublesome. That's what the chair stated, troublesome. So before we go into issues of autonomy of the person, I want a clear and distinct interpretation of the word person, because I sure as hell don't want it applied to corporations. I want autonomy of a human being rather than autonomy of a person, if you know what I mean. Because I'm with a corporate you, entity, <laughs> if we get that nailed, we've got it. Because we absolutely need scrutiny on business maneuvering because that's the ethics of society as a whole. Okay? So Scotland successfully reduced the MLPs by connecting the person. I'm sorry, to MLP? The entity. Yeah, or, or MLPS. Uh, by connecting person to entity the players involved, they reduced it by 80%. That's a good thing, and we need to go there. So thank you. I, to, um, like, in terms of the wording, how can we proceed? Without it being encompassing of both corporation and person as well, individuals. Well, that, that, I mean, I actually, so I used to teach corruption development and good governance, and. I teach that course um, through case studies of countries, and one of the things we discuss in the United States is Citizens United. Yes. And it is a real, the United States is a freak in many ways, and this is, you know, 
a good thing and a bad thing, like so many things, right? Um, in that we do have corporate personhood, and it is an odd but historical truth. And I think the Supreme Court carried it a bit too far. It's really interesting now to see certain Republicans, like Senator Mitch McConnell, realize that Citizens United may at one time have empowered Republicans, but now may not. And I think you'll start to see a rethinking of that decision. That doesn't mean we're gonna change corporate personhood, um, which is a different issue, but the role of corporations as persons in political speech, right? Because we in the United States have this very strange concept of what is commercial speech and what is not what is free speech. And um, the Nike case was a perfect example of that. So I think you'll see some rethinking of that when, if we see a different Congress, hopefully in November, tell all your American friends to vote. That sounds really great. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, but I just want to tell you something. Yes. Um, I may look Barbara Streisandish to you, but I am Pollyanna. I tend to take a very <laughs> optimistic window on things, and so take it with a grain of salt here. Good things take work. <laughs> but I am very hopeful. On the other hand, I said at dinner, we had dinner before we went here, and um, you know, Trump has huge support in the United States. It's a cult, the cult of Trump. You know, and when you're in a cult, it's really hard to get out, even if you totally disagree with the policies. Mm -hmm. Look at the farmers in the United States. They're going to be screwed. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you have to hit bottom to realize you made a mistake. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Over here, please. Yeah, hi. Thank you very much for that talk. I'm, I'm Margaret Walton Roberts. I'm a faculty member affiliated with the Balsillie School here. And um, I, I think a lot of, I really appreciate your presentation and I really appreciate the kind of very pragmatic approach to thinking about what it is we need to do. Because I feel like the majority, you know, your average run of the mill citizen walking around is really not clued in to what is going on. And when we talk about kind of governments and corporations, the first thing I think of is the, the size of Google and Facebook and Amazon and the control that they have over their competitors means we, we're operating in a, in a rather bizarre landscape in terms of this distinction between what we think governments can do and, and expecting them to regulate and control these behemoths. And then the other piece, though, that I, I'm constantly thinking about when you're talking about data and the data-driven economy that we're kind of charging into or that we exist in, and then also talking about artificial intelligence, I worry about what the economy of the future is going to look like, and I wonder how it is that we are going to be able to demand a kind of human-centric economy. So I know there are some basic approaches to things like basic income, but I'm, I'm quite worried that we're going to, to kind of lose, the, the, lose our track, and I don't know what the future is going to hold for us if we can't grasp a hold of what's going on. So I don't know if you have some suggestions in terms of, and I don't know if governments are going to be able to do that. Uh, we're not really appearing on the winning side right now in terms of that notion of having a human-centric economy in the future. I mean, so as a person of the economics persuasion, I agree with you. But I, I think we economists have been kind of brain dead about this. And we're kind of left with this um, continuum between communism, right, where the state controls all, and free market capitalism. And you know, we have variants in between. Each country has their own variant, and that's just great. It may not work for the 21st century, where control of data is so much held, not by governments, but by firms. I agree with you. That said, firms are made up of people, and who are their stakeholders, who are their owners, and, you know, the people of Google may be very happy with their high incomes, but they are really activist, and they're doing a lot of things. You've probably read about the Google 
engineers protest against the use of AI affiliated with DOD. So that's one example. You didn't talk about that. Um, people talk a lot about competition policy as the answer. We need to come up with a new approach to antitrust that allows us to attack these firms that give so much consumer benefits, but, you know, are too big. And while I agree that these firms <laughs> may be too big, I think the answer has to be us, not government. So I want to see a form of literacy, of data literacy, but um, unfortunately, like I would love to write a primer on this, but a primer is of no good unless schools adopt it or, you know what I mean? So this has to be a multi-faceted approach to getting people to care about it. And I worry about that because, I, like I said before, on a daily basis, people are struggling to earn a decent income with a college education. So it's a problem of the economics profession not really having thought out in this new technological economy, what will we do? I really hate the idea of a basic income, though. Are you guys all familiar with that idea, which is a lot of tech companies have said, we know that AI and robotics and 3D printing are going to mean a lot of different types of skills will be less employable. And so people may not be able to find work or work that challenges them. So instead, states should offer them, by taxing firms, states should offer them a basic income and they can work at X job and then spend the rest of their time canoodling or uh, drawing artwork. Um, I, I think that that is a really negative vision of the future. I always believe that if you want to make a better future for your children, you have to make a better future <laughs> for your children. And that means getting involved, whether at the political level or at the local level, or as a teacher, motivating people to get involved. We are piloting basic income in Canada, so hopefully we'll have some data to, <laughs> ironically, to discuss whether or not it does work. What do you think? Let me ask you that. What would you have happen, if I may? Yeah. Uh, sorry, in terms of basic income or? Just in terms of, I'd, I'd be curious to hear what you have to say about the power of these companies and how that should be addressed. Yeah, I mean, it's the, what can you do? In the default is to ask government to regulate, right? So as you say, anti-competition or, or, you know, a return to the role of the government in mandating diversity in, for example, media as it was, say, in the 60s in the States. Because now when you look at the consolidation of media outlets, I mean, that's another, not only is the fake news a problem, but the, f the, the fact that there are limited media outlets and the fact that Facebook and others don't even accept the fact that they're responsible now for, as platforms of news, and they have this highly concentrated feeding of only particular types of news. So that's highly problematic. And again, I agree with you, I think education is going to be key to this, but frankly, uh, currently looking at the US, you know, education has become and is becoming increasingly kind of corporatized and is becoming another money making machine. So, using education for the public civic good, I think, is going to be key to this. And so, how we can enable public education to achieve it is probably the first step. And, and you need to have a very willing. Uh, kind of public backer for that. And I think that is going to fall to the role of government. The wrong government? The role, the role of government. Okay. Government's going to have to step up. Yeah. No, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting question. And you've exposed uh, a, a nuance, which is to say that we, I think most people would agree that the level of disruption that's going to take place in the economy is going to be significant, if not the highest level of disruption that we've ever seen. Um, so it either ranges from significant to the highest w we've ever seen, but somewhere in the middle uh, is where most people fall. Um, so it's, it's going to be clear that the policy levers that governments are going to be asked to pull on to address this are going to be different. Um, and so, you know, you start to see stuff like, will we tax the, ro tax the robots? Can you start, will you tax production uh, that way? Or, you know, there's another, another area that's up for discussion right now is like in intellectual property. It's clear that uh, IP or intellectual property is a huge generator of wealth. 
well, what happens when it's an algorithm that creates something that would be considered copyright protected material? Is it the algorithm that owns it? Is it the person that invented the algorithm? What happens if it's two algorithms that team up and create a work art? Who owns that, right? So the way that we've chosen to govern ourselves and to regulate ourselves is gonna come under stress as we move into this, this disruptive economy. I only wish that there was a senior, CG senior fellow here who'd recently written a paper on the future of work. Joel, I'm looking at you if you wanna uh, uh, step Where up is Joel? At, by, at any point in time. Um, yeah, Joel just wrote there a paper for us on the future of work. What do you time. think? Oh, no. <laughs> As he takes a pass on the question. Um, well, let me, while we're waiting for some, some others to come up, let me ask you this. Um, oh, we have, we have people coming here? Okay. Well, what, they're leaving they're, there. Yeah, they're, they're, <laughs> they're just sneaking out the back. Had it. Yeah, busted. Go ahead. Uh, so, my name's Graham Westmacott. I work in finance in the city. Um, my, my question really uh, was sparked by your mention of algorithms. Um, so, s stepping up from the, the data discussion, uh, it's, it's algorithms that use that data to make decisions. And, um, you know, ever since humans have walked the earth, uh, we have, as biological systems, uh, used algorithms to process data. Now there's an ascendancy towards silicon-based uh, decision-making entities. Um, in broad terms, um, we, we have rules and laws that put some requirements on expectations of fairness for biological systems making algorithmic decisions, uh, to what extent are they applicable in the silicon-based domain, and to what extent are they not? I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. What extent? So can we carry over uh, our current rules and regulations uh, that we apply to, to human decision-making to uh, um, AI and, and uh, intelligent systems. What would be uh, an example of that? Can, we, can I push you on that a little bit? What would be an example of what you're talking about? Um, well, to take a recent example, we've seen uh, machines playing both chess and, and more recently Go. Um, um, in the Go example, uh, there were new ways of playing, new strategies that emerged that hadn't occurred to quite expert Go players. So there was a clear clear benefit um, if you were interested in the game of Go from seeing how a machine was playing the game. Um, uh, set, set against that, um, we have um, a lot of progress towards autonomous vehicles which have to make uh, presumably quite moralistic decisions uh, in a areas where safety uh, forces it to make choices between the safety of the occupants and perhaps the safety of pedestrians. That's right. Um, so but, you know, wh what do we use to, to, to decide whether a algorithm is, is suitable and fair? Um, what can we carry over from our... So technology is always ahead of governance, right? But both are human driven and both suffer from biases and misunderstandings and funding problems and too much money in one area and not enough in another, right? I'm not so worried about that, to tell you the truth. I'm not that worried about um, um, algorithms um, making mistakes but also learning from their mistakes or seeing things in ways that we don't, we can't see because they have a different form of processing power, right? And um, to expect that they won't learn. There was a really interesting scholarly article and um, I just cite this because a, a friend pointed it out to me and it was about algorithmic, um, algorithmic evolution. And it basically was saying how algorithms, computers learn from their mistakes. And how wonderful that is. It's not taking control over us, 
but rather enhancing us because they too make the mistakes and they too think it is in the mistake that the learning occurs, right? If I don't fail at something, I'm never gonna succeed at another thing. I know that sounds like a lecture, but it is from the failure that I learn how to do things differently. So that doesn't worry me that much. What worries me is that we are not discussing this in a transparent, uh, fully democratic manner. And as, um, I didn't get the professor's name, but as she mentioned, governance has not caught up to this. And I think unless people are involved in this discussion, if it's just corporate people doing the algorithms and determining the rules, and if the companies that make these rules or influence these rules are too big, they might not be as people-centered as we'd like them to be. So I'm more worried about the governance than I am actually about the technology. Because I, you know, science has always challenged us and technology has always challenged us, right, from in that way. And governance has been behind. I just cite as example the influence of the railroads on creating national markets, right? That, uh, telecommunications changes that had a huge impact on governance, right? When you could transfer money in a nanosecond, that had a huge impact. But we figured out ways to govern it. And I think we will do so, but only if people demand it. No, in your example, I mean, the car example is one that I think resonates, right? So um, suppose rather than AI or, or some sort of automated system being behind the wheel, you have a person. And the car hits black ice, the person has to make a, a, a split decision. If I go left, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to veer into, the, into oncoming traffic. Um, if I go right, my, I'm going to drive my car off of a bridge. Um, and so a, de a, a split second decision is made. If the decision uh, results in catastrophic loss or injury, then uh, rules come into play like negligence, dangerous driving, potentially a criminal offense. But we've got a regulatory system around that. The, the point I think that you were driving at and the subtle, the subtle answer to, to your question is that we don't have a system in place yet to, to govern the, uh, the, when an autonomous vehicle makes that decision and it's the wrong one. We just don't have a system system yet. Joel, you, uh, you've, uh, you've graced us with your presence. Thank you very much uh, with, uh, with uh, very gentle prodding. Uh, Joel, please. Uh, so Joel Blitt, I'm a senior fellow here at CG and a professor at Waterloo in economics. So I, I thought I'd um, go back to the previous discussion a little bit and just offer a couple of comments and then end with a question. Um, so probably the single thing that I worry about the most uh, is you know, the future of work and the economy for our kids and whether, uh, at least for the majority of, of kids who are maybe now five, what it's gonna look like, whether they're gonna be able to find jobs, et cetera. Um, I think it's gonna be a really big challenge from a policy perspective. Uh, I agree with you fully that um, education is gonna be extremely important so that the population at large is sort of uh, on the same bandwidth and pushing in the same direction, trying to somehow be a counterweight to these huge corporations that are natural monopolies, because that's fundamentally what they are. Um, but I think it's gonna take a little more than education individuals. I think there's gonna have to be a lot of government involvement. Now, the thing that I worry about is that any one government is not gonna be able to take on these, these very large firms. And essentially, it's a global issue. Because even if the individuals uh, and the government say want to regulate, these corporations can just go somewhere else. And, and so there's this, these corporations can, can go. Can they? Well, I mean, uh, if Canada has signed an agreement that we're handing over our data and that there's free trade, which for the, you know, data can go across borders, what do we really have over these corporations? Uh, and so I, I guess here's where I come to my question. Is part of the solution also going to require all the major governments of the world working together to regulate, to make sure that these tax havens are not allowing corporations to set up there and do whatever they want with no recourse basically for anyone? Yeah, so um, first of all, this guy is, the economist of technological change, so I just want to introduce him. <laughs> but um, I see it kind of differently. 
I, I, I guess I disagree with your premise that we don't have control. And I will just cite a personal example from my business history. So I, uh, I guess about 10, 11 years ago, I was Ford Motor Company's human rights advisor while being a professor. So it was a part-time job. Ford could give a shit about human rights, really. There was no one on the board who cared. But, um, but you know what? Amnesty International, so again, that's group of people organized. And, and frankly, if I had to pick any human rights organization that is inept, I would call it Amnesty International because they work on every possible human rights issue you can find, and that's often ineffective. You've got to pick some, one or two or three things but they like to do everything. So Amnesty International found out that the um, various government entities in Brazil were using trucks to transport slaves. Um, there's a lot of slavery still in Brazil. And when Amnesty found it out, they didn't have to do anything because the Brazilian government was, was doing the transporting. They were helping, there were various members of the Brazilian uh, Congress who owned these slaves and wanted to do nothing about it. My long-winded point here is that Amnesty was able to name and shame corporations. And, um, you know, again, that's a prominent NGO. These NGOs don't exist yet, but I would say in the next couple of years, we're going to have a lot of NGOs pummeling Google. And Google is a company you and I have lots of leverage over, yes, they are way too big. I don't know if um, regulation is the way to get at that. I'm not sure because I love the way Google innovates and I think in the end, a lot of those innovation, I hate to deprive the world of that. At the same time, okay, so what is our leverage over Google? Google cannot succeed without our information. And if five countries get together of 600 million people, especially middle class customers who care about how their data is used. Believe me, Google will respond, especially given that they have a mission statement that essentially says, do no evil. But that's just one company. We want all of them to respond. I also want to respond to your idea about technological change and the power of governments. Um, I do think this is a different world. It is different from histor historically. But we are saying something really bad about human beings if we're basically saying that we should just give up and roll over because technology is going to make it hard for us to find jobs. We make the technologies and we make the government. And we can sit quiet, which will get us nowhere, or we can change the world. And I see people changing the world. They can do it if they want to do it, and they will do it. I mean, shareholder activism can be meaningless, but when you see ExxonMobil <laughs> say climate change is real and fight the Trump administration on some things, that, that to me is the power of people. So why give up on it, Joel? Well, I'll, I, I'll leave it at that, but I wanted to say I, I much prefer your message to mine. And, and uh, <laughs> that's why I'm a professor of the dismal signs, but. <laughs> uh, it was a, it's a good question. And, you know, this idea of the disruption in the workforce and making it more difficult for our children to secure jobs was something that, that I, I kind of resonated with me. Although I will say this, I've got a, Joel used the example of a five-year-old. I have a five-year-old son at home, and I'm actually not worried about him in his future career because he's told me in no uncertain terms that he's going to be Spider-Man when he grows up. So <laughs> I'm fairly certain he'll be okay. Please, did you have a question? Over here, oh please, yep. I'm wondering with this new economy and this new data-driven economy and the complexity and demands and sophistication of it, how do those who, are, who can't succeed in education, who aren't sophisticated, how do they participate in that economy and how can big data help them to participate so that we don't have larger and larger groups of socially excluded people? Yeah, that's the adjustment. I mean, that I think has a lot to do with what's going on in the United States today. You know, um, I think that technology and education has passed by a large cohort of people, but I also think, I'm not sure it's the fault of technology. I think it's to a great extent the fault of 
how education is funded in the United States. You know, um, education is funded through local taxes and controlled at the state level in the United States. We don't have any federal curriculum, although there is federal funding, but it's like grants to various school districts. So my long-winded point here is that um, in poorer communities, education is often sacrificed, whereas you live in a middle class or rich community, the schools are better. And you see that reflected in property values, and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So I think that has as much to blame with, but that didn't answer your question. So what do you do about those people? Because, you know, um, I've seen this happen with trade, right, where steel workers are told, Here's $20,000, retrain yourself, become a nursing home supervisor or something like that. And for people who worked with their hands and who thought they had a middle income job, they, at age 57, they may not be able to train. So I don't think there are any easy answers. But I do think that that's why I like the stakeholder idea. If you give people, if you say, I trust you to use education, whether it's apprenticeship education, I'm not going to tell you what you should be. Because in your job, in your career life, you may have seven different jobs in different fields. But I believe in you, and I'm going to invest a stake in you. Okay, and you can use that money. That money, the state will invest that money for you. And let's say it's 10,000 Canadian dollars when you're born. And, and when you become 18 and become eligible to take advantage of that money, you may decide, you know what? I'm not going to go to college, I'm, and I'm not going to tap my money. And so it it becomes $37,000 or whatever over time. Meanwhile, you work as a plumber, which is a huge demand. And, you know, at least in my country, I can't speak for Canada, there's lots of jobs for plumbers and not enough plumbers in the United States. But I can tell you the other side of it. If you're in your 50s in the United States, despite what the, you know, fantastic unemployment statistic touted last week, there are so many unemployed and underemployed people over 50 in the United States. It's heartbreaking. And I think, you know, it's that cohort that I think really feels like technology has passed them by and they can't catch up. And that really worries me. I'm less worried about our children because not only do you see them texting like crazy, right, but they adapt to technology. See, I think in human... We resist change, but we're inherently made to, to accept change. I didn't phrase that well, but we can learn with change. We can lean into change. We can learn from change, you know? Again, that's the Pollyanna in me. So I'm less worried about children than I am about the people now who have lost their jobs because they, it's, they, they, they just have nothing to offer society because a machine is doing their job or an algorithm is doing their job. And that is a um, kind of an insightful and both uh, both insightful and positive note to uh, to end on. And before I before <laughs> I ask you uh, to to help me in thinking, Susan, I did want to call your attention to a few uh, events that we have coming up. Um, so on June fifth, uh, we'll be right back here, and we're partnering with Waterloo uh, uh, Waterloo Region. Um, Power Shift to present a screening of a new documentary film called The Social Shift, uh, which focuses on how businesses can and meet their responsibility to contribute to the greater good of society. Actually, that was certainly the subtext of some of the things we were talking about tonight. And what's actually cool about, uh, about June 5th is the filmmakers will be here. It's Megan and Mary Wright, um, so not the Wright brothers, it sounds like the Wright sisters, <laughs> um, will be on hand for a question and answer uh, following the film. And Brian, correct me if I'm wrong, we still do the popcorn on those nights, right? Yeah, so you can come in on, so June 5th, uh, uh, so what sounds like a smart movie with the directors and, and popcorn will be right here. Um, and then on June 13th, and I actually had to, Brian gave me these notes before coming up, and I had to check to make sure that there wasn't a typo, and, and here's why. It's a free lunch given to you by lawyers, and I had to double check, and I'm allowed to make that. <laughs> I'm allowed to make that joke because I'm a lawyer. Um, so it's a lunchtime event on international trade and legal services. Um, the rest restrictions in place that slow the growth of industry and the mechanisms that can help overcome those barriers. So that's on Wednesday, uh, June the 13th. Uh, David Collins, who's a professor of international economic law at the uh, City University of London, uh, will be the speaker. 
uh, for the noon hour talk. And so that'll be preceded by a light, light lunch uh, uh, at 11.30 on June the 13th. And um, just, I, I'm sure most of you are, but if you're not, um, you can register to receive notifications of our, our events because we're doing neat stuff like this all the time. So you just hit our website, uh, cg.org. Uh, forward slash events, and you can actually subscribe to our, our newsletter uh, there, and then you can get regular updates on both our events and our research uh, that's coming out uh, kind of in, in real time. So uh, as we close tonight, I wanted to, to, to leave uh, kind of on one, one thought. Um, it strikes me like we're looking at the public policy challenge of a generation. Um, how we regulate ourselves and how we govern data is something that is going to be difficult and the stakes couldn't be much higher. But I'm comforted by the fact that there are people like Susan Aronson working on it and I'm glad that she's part of the CG team. So thank you very much to Susan. Please join me in, in thanking our speaker, Susan Aronson.